So today we are going to learn about introduction to airports and heliports. So Muskan, can you confirm my screen is on full, uh, full screen mode? Can you see the full screen mode? Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay, so I hope you all are doing well. So let's start with our today's session. First, we look into the airports part. So how can you define the term airport? Like, uh, can you tell me the activities or something? So airport is some also uh, called as uh, air terminal, or a few people say it as an aerodrome or an airfield site. So this place is actually installed for takeoff and the landing of an aircraft. So this thing is quite familiar to all of us. So an airport uh, usually ha usually has paid uh, like uh, the runways and the maintenance facilities and it serves as a terminal for the passengers as well as the cargo. So what do you think that this term, this airport has like nowadays so much developed? So what could be the reasons behind that? So to tell you that it's not used for just uh, for the air transportation, but yes, it serves more other purposes. So the requirement for the airports have increased in uh, like very large scale since the earliest days of time. So if I talk about World War II, so in that period of time, the landing and takeoff distance of the most passenger transport aircraft was like uh, almost 600 meters like additional clear areas were provided for the blind landings or the bad weather runs. But the total area uh, involved for any takeoff or any landing really exceeded like 500 acres. So it was not until the general introduction of heavy monoplanes for the transport, such as if I had taken an example of the DC-3 uh, DC aircraft during late uh, 1930s, so uh, that extensive takeoff and landing distance were needed because that aircraft need to require like a long runway. So even then, the river airfield at the New York City and if I talk about other places such as it could be London, uh, Paris, and Berlin. So these were like laid out on the sides, the city centers, right? So, because even aircraft uh, transportation of the period were relatively light and they were paved runways and those were like, like quite rare. So, early airports were also the major centers of leisure activities. So, like you almost have been knowing that out of the world, like there are so many airports who are like five stars or the three stars. So this concept came into the mind like back in year 1939, the airport, like the Guardia Airport. So that airport had like 250,000 50, visitors per month. So reason being that the airport was ser serving various other leisure activities and, the and that place actually attracted many of the visitors. And that, that figure like 250,000 went it to 7 lakh per month, like uh, within a few time span. So the reason being that the infrastructure was really attractive and nowadays you can see that airport consists of ma mainly many of the shopping malls, you can see many of the brands over there you can shop, even though they have various restaurants. So that is another thing that the airport brings the business. So. The status of Prevor Airport as major social centers was reflected in their design, especially where the requirements of catering, observation decks, and the parking were paramount. So indeed, the requirements of aircraft and passengers were not only the dominant at the early air phase. Okay. So now talking about the evolution of airports. So the largest airports in the world employ more than one lakh workers each. So uh, they are immensely complex entities with regard to the physical facilities, 
that they comprise, as well as the organizations that are active within the boundaries and the conjugation with their operation. So if I talk about some of the physical activities at the airport, so this could include a, a, of runways, taxi ways, aprons, and which are usually used for the takeoff and the landing of the aircraft, as well as for the maneuvering and the positioning of aircraft on the ground and for the parking of an aircraft in order to load and discharge uh, the passengers in a cargo. So, for the safe landing and takeoff of aircraft, lightning and the radio navigational aids are provided. So, as you must have known that radio navigation is used between the communication of an air traffic controller and a pilot. So, these are supplemented by the airfield markings, signs and the signals and air traffic control facilities. So, support facilities on the air side of the field include meteorology, fire and rescue, and these are the some more emergency like tasks which are uh, hold at the standby. So if an emergency occurs, these team can come and rescue. So power and other utilities, the aircraft maintenance and air airport maintenance. So land side facilities are like passengers and the cargo terminals and the access system which includes parking, so parking roads and the public transport facilities and the loading as well as the unloading of the areas. So now the question comes is like an aircraft has so many physical operations to operate and not only the aircraft like airports, like there are so many airlines as well who are uh, like operating at the regular basis. So I must tell you that uh, there are so many organizations like the national as well as the international who are involved into all the daily operations, like because to uh, like to operate anything, there are a set of rules that are made, right? So who, so which organization is there who sets the rules for a particular thing? So overall management is a usually in control of an organization or authority or the company that holds a license to operate the facility. So the license is granted by the National Civil Aviation Authority. So the National Civil Aviation Authority, like it, every country has their own civil aviation authority and I'll just talk in brief about that as well. So these authorities, they manage everything and they, come, they tend to run an airport with the national rules and if applicable, uh, with the international rules as well. So while overall responsibility for efficient, safe, and legal operation lies within the airport management. So uh, many of the individual services at uh, an airport are provided by other organization. So uh, such organization includes airlines, air traffic control authorities, ground handling companies, and the fixed base operators, and security organizations, uh, and it could also include the governmental agencies, which are responsible for the customs and the immigration, the health control, and the police support companies. So, which providing the flight catering, fueling of an aircraft, as well as aircraft maintenance or the aircraft engineering. So here you can see a few international bodies I have mentioned, like the one being International Civil Aviation Organization. The second one is International Air Transport Association. Third is Airport Council International. And the fourth is Aircraft Owners and Pilot Association. So these are a few major international organizations who are here to operate and handle all the rules and regulations that are being operated on a regular basis on any of the airport, or uh, you can say in the, any of the airlines. Okay, so now I am going to talk in brief about these organizations. So before I talk about these, so I would like to tell you about a few airport services. So 
Airport services related to the aircraft are frequently referred to as air sites. So, which I have just mentioned uh, in the beginning. So, many of these services are concentrated on the ramp. So, which is the part of the operational surface, which is adjacent to the terminals, where the aircrafts are maneuvered or they are parked. They include the apron of handling the aircraft and the airside passengers transfer to the aircraft, the handling of the baggage and the cargo. As you might have traveled through an aircraft, so you must all be familiar with these activities that how the onboard procedures uh, comes and then uh, like, and then how you get into an aircraft. Okay, so you might have also been seen like an aircraft while going to the maintenance check or the aircraft fueling. And the meanwhile, in the cabin section, you can see the cabin crew serving the people, they are catering or they are cleaning. And then once the things get like done, then this then the engines get started. So then after that, the ground power is generated and the air conditioning is started and the minor maintenance engineering takes place. So these are a few airside activities which are done in order to prepare uh, an aircraft for its flight. So other side services, airside services are runway inspection. So before an aircraft to get on the runway, it is really required to inspect the whole of the runway to check the lighting as well as the navigational aid, the firefighting and the rescue air site, maintenance and the air traffic control, which is must. So among the land side service, there are those that to the ground passenger handling. So ground passenger handling includes of the passengers who are getting for the coming for the flight. So or the team for the ground passenger is there to for the check-in security, to check the customs as well as the immigration. Also, they handle the baggage delivery. They provide information about the, the flight, but if it is any delay or it is uh, the time, something like that. And the information of the flight, also the catering, the cleaning and the maintenance. And there, as I have mentioned that there could be many shops, you can, um, uh, reliable, you can go and have some the concessionary facilities. Other than that, uh, it includes like automobile rental and the ground transportation. And there are computers as well who help uh, to transfer the baggages and uh, uh, special help for the elderly and the handicapped. Yeah, so there could be some chances like an, an old person is like traveling alone, so he might need an assistance. So for that case as well, they are they are like they can get special help from the department of uh, from the uh, like ground staff department of an airport. So because airport employs such a large number of workers, so the extensive provision must be made for their uh, for their daily requirements. So now you may have got an idea that how long the management is being operated at an airport as it has so many tasks to perform on a daily basis and it is really required that everything should function in a proper manner. Okay, so now coming up on civil aviation organization. So what is civil aviation organization? So any, any country has their own civil aviation organization to set up some rules for uh, which makes an aircraft fit to fly. So the aim and the objective of such organization are to just to, the plan, uh, to plan and develop the international air, air, air transport so as to ensure the safe and the orderly growth of international civil aviation throughout the world, uh, whether it takes the encouraging of arts of uh, the aircraft design and operation for peaceful purpose. So there are national civil aviation authority, which is abbreviated as NAA, or uh, it could also be termed as civil aviation authority, which is abbreviated as CAA, is a governmental 
authority in each country like every country has their own national civil aviation authority which governs the rule that uh, like they maintain an aircraft register and overseas and they check up for the approval and the regulation of civil aviation okay so now as you can see on the side it's the icao so it's the international civil aviation organization so i hope you all have heard about this because this is a some like an international organization which is here to provide some regulations and the rules for the fluent operation of an airline or of an aircraft So, this organization is basically funded and directed by 193 national governments to support their diplomacy and the cooperation in air transport as signatory states to the Chicago Convention 1944. So, its core function is to maintain an administrative and expert bureaucracy the ICAO secretary supporting these diplomatic interactions and to research new air transport policy and standardization innovation as directed and endorsed by the government through the ICAO assembly. So this particular organization has a vision as well as a mission. So if I talk about the vision, the International Civil Aviation Organization is a specialized and it is a, a kind of funding agency which is in the United States. Its headquarters is in the United States. So it changes the principles and the techniques of international air navigation and it fosters the planning and the development of international air transport to ensure the safety as well as the growth. So this is the vision which they serve. And if I talk about the mission, so uh, the role of civil aviation is controlled by ICAO only. Like the main objective of this organization is to agree on international civil aviation mindsets and also it uh, recommends practices and the policies between a number of countries like there are various groups involved into such a big organization as i mentioned that it is being run globally in uh, like 196 different places so their mission is to uh, develop a same as well as the efficient and to make it economy, uh, economically uh, sustainable and a very environmental friendly civil authority So this is the purpose and the mission and the vision to serve by this particular organization. Okay, so now moving on to next is ITA. So can somebody tell me the full form? Okay, so to run any company, you need to get some standards to prepare it to operate fluently, right? So, we will look into some of such organizations like the one we have uh, talked about before and now it is the International Air Transport Association. So, IDA is the International Air Transport Association. Here you can see the logo. So, the people who are associated with the travel and tourism department, they must be familiar with this term. So IATA is the trade association for the world airlines, which represents some uh, 290 airlines or 82% of total of air traffic they support. So there are many areas of aviation activity and they help formulate industry policy on crucial aviation issues. So if I talk about this particular organization, so any airlines or airports or the countries who are running ticketing across the world are regulated by the ITA. 
So if you go to an uh, like a ticketing agent and you ask to get your ticket from like LA to London or some any 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 place across the globe. So all of the ticketing department, if you get it through online or if you get it through the airport or if you get it through a ticketing agent, so all of these things are regulated by the ITA only. So this organization is partnered with over 200 plus airlines that I have mentioned, like around 290, airline, 290 airlines. And it is expanded over 100 plus countries across the globe. So this organization also serves a vision as well as it has a mission. If I talk about the vision of AITA, so its vision is working together to shape the future both to safe, to secure and sustainable air transport industry that connects as well as enriches our world. Now, talking about the mission, the one being the leading the airline industry. So many of you have uh, traveled by aircraft, right? So I would like to ask you that have you ever thought about like why your boarding pass have some specific information like uh, the boarding pass usually includes of the, your legal name as well as uh, the, it includes the flight information that the departure as well as the landing details. So you all might, uh, might have like thought about that. How are the like these uh, flight scheduled or like uh, the con so nowadays, like a few years back, the concept of e-ticketing introduced, right? So earlier, like people has to, had to uh, visit like uh, they had to visit the ticketing agent or they just had to go to the airport and get their tickets done. And nowadays you can just sit relaxly with the laptop and you can get your tickets done through your mobile phones or to the laptop. So have you ever thought that which organization is here to implement such ideas or who is the behind all these things, right? So these, all of these basic rules and regulations and the concepts are handled by the ITA only. So ITA controls all the rules and the regulations for the safety. And it also works on how to give benefits to the customers. Like uh, there could be a few customers who, uh, like, who are buying tickets, right? So there could be some regular customers as well. So if uh, so, they have a prepared database. Like if any customer is buying the tickets on a regular basis, so the company's organization also think to provide some ben extra benefits to the customers. So they usually think that what facilities they can provide to them while they are on board. Like these facilities could include of like they can serve them the free food. So this could be a few facilities which a customer can get or they can get some discounts on their next flight, something like that. So usually 80% of the rules and the regulations which are related to the air ticketing. So these are only controlled by AITA all over the world. So people who are interested to begin their career in air ticketing, like if you wish you would like to join this career, like you want to be work as an air ticketer. So IDA organization is really important to them, I must tell. And not only about air ticketing, but, but this organization also handles a few major things of an airport, as well as the airplanes just to ensure the safety. And they are into uh, introducing new technologies. Just one I mentioned, like the concept of uh, e-ticketing. So this organization is working to bring some new technologies, new concepts to make the air travel very easy for the uh, passengers. So, so this organization also provides the trainings, which is regulated uh, on, 80% by the ITA only. So if I talk, like ITA is really a huge organization than any of the civil aviation uh, organization. 
So any of you know, any of among us, if you want to pursue your career into academia, so you must join a few like a few courses like the provide, and you can directly get your career into this uh, organization. Okay, so coming up to the next, that is ACI. ACI is nothing but it's Airports Council International. So here you can see. So this is actually a global trade representative of world airport authorities. So in 1991, uh, the airport operators around the world created Airport Council uh, International. So this organization came into existence in 1991. So this was the first worldwide association to represent their common interests and foster cooperation with partners throughout the air transport industry. Through ACI, the airport community now speaks with a single voice on key issues and concerns. And despite regional diversity, they can move forward as a united industry. So ACI represents airports in trust with governmental and international organization. They are into the developing standards and the policies, as well as recommending practices for the air airports. So ACI, uh, as I have mentioned that they are uh, like handling all the policies and the practices used for at, for at the airports and the ACI also provides information and also they provide training opportunities to raise the standards around the world. It aims to provide the public a safe, secure, efficient, and an environmentally responsible air transport system. So if I talk about the mission of this organization, so ACI advances the collective interest of and acts as the voice of the world's airport and the communities to serve. So also they promote professional excellence in airport management and the operations. So if I talk about uh, their objectives and the rules, so it is to maximize contributions of airports to maintaining and uh, developing a safe, secure, and environmentally compatible and efficient air transport system. Also, its objective is to achieve cooperation among all the segments of the aviation industry and the stakeholders as well as, well as with government and the international organizations. Okay, so next coming to the aircraft owners and the pilot association. Okay, so if I talk about this particular organization, so since 1939, Alba has protected the freedom to fly for thousands of pilots, aircraft owners, and the aviation enthusiasts. So this is the world's largest member of aviation association. It represented based in Frederick in the Washington DC and in the seven regions across the United States. So this provides member services that range from advocacy at federal, state, and local levels to legal services, flight planning products, safety programs and award me winning media products. So I must tell you that this is the world's largest community of the pilots and the largest brand in aviation. So if I talk about the aviation brands, so this is should this should come in your mind, aircraft owners and the pilot association. So uh, I must tell you that the products and the services of this organization are the broadest reaching media platform and in terms of aviation technology. And uh, this brand includes some of the products 
that usually pilots use to travel the country and the world. So this company has actually more than 6 lakh customers already. And this expands in 74 countries across the world. So the aviation brand which we are talking, so this brand also serves a mission. So its mission is to inspire, to grow, educate, and promote the freedom of flight through the world-class media products, the services, as well as the advocacy. Okay, so coming on to the next, the next is IPU, that is uh, International Telecommunication Union, which is in Geneva. So the International Telecommunication Union is the United States Specialized Agency for the Information and the Communication Technologies. So this organization was founded in uh, 1865 in order to facilitate the international connectivity in the communication networks. So they allocate global radio spectrum and satellite orbits to develop the technical standards that ensure networks and the technology which are seamlessly interconnected and strive to improve the access to ICTs to understand communities worldwide. So every time you make a phone call uh, via a mobile and access the internet to send an email, so you are definitely benefiting this organization from the work of IT. Now, coming up to the next is WMO. So this is World Meteorological Organization, which too lies in Geneva. So aviation meteorology which is possibly the most important data stream for air traffic management, services uh, given its impact on both safety and efficiency. Also, with the development and increasing reliance on satellite navigation, space weather is also becoming very important in aviation. So, that was all about a few civil aviation organizations which I have mentioned. And other than that, uh, if I talk about the national civil authorities of each country, so you all must have been heard about FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. Like uh, you have heard about YASA, and you have, uh, like if I talk about uh, YASA, so it is the European uh, Union Aviation and the Safety Agency, which is the agency of Europe, actually. And if I tell about the Indian, so it is uh, DGC, that is the Directorate General of Civil Aviation. So these are a few uh, like national uh, civil aviation authorities. Okay, so now I hope you all have got a clear idea about the, all the activities and the services which are held on any airport or at any of the airlines and uh, who are the organization behind the operation of such activities. So now we'll move on to the types of airports. So airports are also can be classified into different categories. So if I talk about being one, the one is civil airports. So the airport, uh, which is uh, which provides the facilities for the commercial use only. So it could include uh, like transportation of the passengers from one place to other place, or it could include the transportation of the cargo. So airports often have facilities to store and maintain aircraft and the control tower. Control tower where an APC operates. So an airport, it consists of a terminal building. So uh, also the landing area, which comprises an early accessible open space, including at least one operational active service, such as a runway for a plane to take off or a helipad. And often it includes adjacent utility buildings, such as control towers and the hangars and the terminals. So some of airports provide only domestic services and some may include the international services as well.
So we're talking more about the civil airports. So by the type of usage and as permitted by the BDCA, the airport is authorized to operate civil commercial operations, that is passenger and the cargo operations. So the user's airlines pay a prescribed fee to use the airport services in assurance the global standards and the recommended practices of ICAO. So civil airports are the entry or the exit points for the domestic and international operations with the availability of border control measures like immigration, customs, and health checks. So people who are into traveling, who have traveled, so they must be familiar like once you start with the onboard procedures, you need to go to the immigration part, your customs, and as well as your health check. So it's not only uh, during uh, your check-in part before you proceed for the fly for the takeoff. After the la after landing to a particular airport of an, an, any other country, you might have to go again with the immigration process, the customs, as well as the health checks. So these are a few mandate operations which are done to ensure the safety of the passengers. Okay, so talking about a few airports which comes under the civil airports. So the one being the joint venture or the PPP airports. So with the pronounced and the quick improvement needed in the airport services on the ground, so the government of India in 2006, they, like, their policy permitted AAI. So AAI is the Airport Authority of India to hand over some of the major airports and in as the, uh, where is the basis of the private operator. So if I talk about the air traffic services, so it includes of handling over the Mumbai and the Delhi airports. Also, the private operators play, uh, pay annually a contracted percentage of their turnover as a fees for the ready-made infrastructure handed to them on a 30-year of lease basis. Okay, so coming up to the next type of airport, uh, airport this is a greenfield or a private airport. So this airport means develop an airport from the scratch where uh, no airfield existed. Uh, so this is termed as a greenfield airport. So the causes acquisition of required extent of land from private government land design the airport for a particular level of aircraft and domestic or international operations that obtain all of the power and the water supplies which are really necessary so the coaching international airport was the first to come up in 2000 the one being in india so which is followed by the another one which is cal which lies in bangalore so these are a few examples of the greenfield or the private airports. Now, coming up to the third is governmental owned airports. Uh, so these airports are fully owned by the and operated by the government or any of the airport authority of uh, the country. So the fourth one being is the non-commercial airports. So the airports which are operated other than the commercial operations like transportations of the air cargo or the passengers. It's like in uh, general aviation, people uh, owning the private jets for their own or uh, the places which are serving for the corporates. So it, um, it provides uh, also this airport also provides the facility of testing of the aircraft, both on the ground as well as in the air, also to provide the medical purpose, to facilitate the movement of passengers on the medical grounds, this, this is ambulance. And uh, the other activities may include the VVIP operations, 
uh, just like the government dignitaries, like president or the PM or the other government dignitaries. So they usually travel through VVIP flights only. So this, the non-commercial airport serves um, to these kind of things. So that was all about talking about the airports. So now we'll learn a few more about the heliport. So a uh, heliport is an uh, area of land or of a water or a structural surface which is used or intended used for the landing and the takeoff of helico uh, helicopters, whether on a regular or on an irregular basis. And an important area which are used are intended for use for heliport buildings and other heliport facilities. So a heliport is a small airport which is used exclusively for the helicopters operation only. So this being very small, reason being you all must know that the helicopter is something which usually requires only a vertical takeoff and landing. These don't require a long runway to have a ground run. So the helicopters are capable to get in a vertical takeoff and left. So that is why you all must have uh, seen the heliport uh, heli or the helipad mostly. The helipads are usually construct can be constructed on a terrace of a strong building. So there is a little difference between a helipad as well as the heliport. So if I talk about helipad, it is a landing area or a platform for the helicopters. Whereas heliport is an airport, actually the port which is designed for the helicopter use. So helipad being the landing area or the platform for the vertical lift of the helicopters. So through a helipad, you can just uh, like take off or land a uh, helicopter. You can't go for any other of the other operational activities. And being, uh, and if I talk about the heliport, so it also serves some other major activities, which includes a fun helicopter to perform. So here you can see a few image of a helipad. Like these are the places, these are the helipads. So you can use this just for the takeoff as well as the landings. So no other things you can perform over here, no other operations can be done. Okay. So now, uh, Talking about a few codes and uh, some uh, phonetic numbers and their pronunciation. So you can see uh, like numbers are coded, like they have a few coded word as well as their phonetic pronunciation because you know, every country has their own pronunciation. Like people belonging from India has their own accent. People belonging from America has their own accent and South Africa, then comes the British countries. So every country has their own accent. So to make communication very easy and to make it on a standard level, so there is some phonetic numbers, which are, here you can see, and a standard pronunciation has been generated. So the people belonging from all of the countries must be familiar with these codes and the pronunciation to make the communication very easy and to it. So if I talk about the number zero, it's code word is zero, and it is pronounced as Z and Ro. And then it's Z and Ro. And then the, coming up to the one, so it is pronounced as one. Then to coming up to the two, it's two. Then three is three. Then the four is four. Then five is five. Then six being six, seven is seven, eight is eight, then nine is nine, hundred is hundred, and the, the thousand is thousand. 
So this is a few phonetic pronunciation which is made standard. So coming up on the next. Okay, I'll just share my screen again. Okay, so after the cow, uh, like, so there is some uh, alphabetical notation which is also made standard, like uh, to communicate, to, uh, like they use these alphabets. So they, like if they have other people belonging from the Air Force, basically they use these alphabets, like they, they use these terms, like for A, they use alpha, for B, they speak Bravo, C is for Charlie, B is Delta, E is for Echo, F is for Foxtrot, then G is for Gulf, then H belong, then H is for Tail, then I is India, J is Juliet, K is Kilo, L is Lima, M is Mike, N is November, then O is Oscar, P is Papa, Q is Quebec, then R is Romeo, etc. Then P is Tango, U is Uniform, V is Victor, W is Whiskey, X is X-ray, Y is Yankee, and Z is Zulu. Okay, so as I have uh, talked about uh, Aita and uh, one more uh, international organization that is IAEA, that is International Atomic Energy Agency. So you almost have uh, like familiar with the uh, cargo transportation. Like there could be different types of cargo which is transported transported uh, through the aircraft. So these like the cargos which is being transported. It has a few classic classification that it is classified into different categories. So these classes can vary from class one to class nine. So if I talk about the class one, it is represented by the code one or 1.4 or 1.5. So the goods like uh, which are classified in class one, these goods are very like these are the explosive substances and the articles. So these substances which are like exported who comes under the explosives category. So these are classified into the class one and other and there's sub, uh, subcategories like 1.4 and 1.5. Then coming up with the next, so that is class two, which consists of the goods which is with gases. So, if an aircraft carrying a flammable gas, so this is classified into the red mark. So, the, on that, uh, you will see a red uh, mark as this is in the air. And if the container is containing the non flammable gas, which is not much like harmful, so it won't catch fire. So, that would be uh, like having a mark of a green. And uh, if the there is a toxic gas. So there, it will be marked as a danger. So it comes in the danger. So these are really like really, really important to make the travel to like to transport it safely, like very safely. So these class two uh, like categories, it consists of the gases. Now coming up with the class three. So it includes of the flammable liquid. So if you wish, you can take the screenshot of the slide and else the recording of the session will be provided to you. 
So the class three is the flammable liquid and it is marked with a color of red and here you can see that it could catch fire. So it is like uh, marked in such a way. Then coming to the class four. So it comprises of a few solid things like the one, the flammable solid. So to differentiate it from the like flammable liquid and the flammable gas, the flammable solid, it is um, like you can see the white and the red stripes. So it is marked like this. So the flammable solid, it comes under the category of class 4.1. Now, coming on to the next, class 4.2. So, it, include, it includes of the liable to the spontaneous combustion that can uh, like partially be like a little lesser harm, but yeah, but they can get, uh, they can catch fire. So, this comes under the class 4.2 category. Then comes to the next, the next substance being which can get fire when it comes into contact with water. So this comes under the class of 4.3. Then coming on to the class 5.1, it is the oxidizing agent. And the class 5.2 is the organic peroxide. Then again, class 6.1 is the toxic. In the class 6.2 is the infectious substance and the class 7 being the radioactive material. Then the class 8 is the corrosive and the class 9 could be the miscellaneous. So these are a few uh, like safety precautions and the setups which are like different goods are differentiated into subcat in subcategories. So ensure that they are being transported, transported like you know safe a safety manner. Okay, so that was all about the today's session about the airports as well as the heliports. So I hope you all have learned um, many new things. And also I will be showing you a video. So that video is based on the airport operations and how it is managed. So I'll show you in a while. So as for now, I hope you all are clear with the activities which are uh, conducted on an airport as well as at the air side. video that is based on so the next video it is based on some type of civil aircrafts the top civil aircrafts so I'll share it 